All right, hello. Um, so my name is Rowena Grant, and as you can tell from my accent, I have come down from Salford. Um, <laughs> so I am the University of Salford's Alumni Engagement Manager, and it is an absolute pleasure to see so many of our alumni and supporters here this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit about the format. Um, so our general format today is after the most stunning housekeeping speech, that's going to keep you all wrapped with attention. Um, our Vice Chancellor will welcome you all with probably a little bit more occasion than I'm offering right now. Uh, we will hear from our speakers on tonight's topic, followed by a bit of a Q&A session. Uh, we would then love for you to join us for some refreshments afterwards. So a few housekeeping announcements before we start. There is not a planned fire drill, so if an alarm sounds, please follow the venue staff's instructions and make your way to the fire exits, which are out these doors. You can see the sign there. Um, and around to the right or straight on, it'll be fine. Somebody will guide us. Um, there's also a waiting point for any guests who do have access needs, um, and that is in the same direction. Um, toilets situated on the ground floor towards the entrance and on your right, so in behind where that registration desk was. Uh, we do have some accessible toilets either on your right or on your left out of this door. Um, please check your phones, make sure they are on silent, lest you be harshly judged for your choice of ringtone. Uh, this is a non-smoking venue, Royal College of Surgeons, we like health. Uh, so, if you do need to smoke or vape, please make sure you are completely leaving the grounds. That means not just outside, you actually have to go onto the other side of the fence as well. Uh, today's session is being recorded by one of our alumni. Uh, we will email you with a link when that recording is ready. Uh, if you have asked not to have your photo taken and do not wish to be recorded, please just make a note of where the cameras are, which is over on this side. Uh, uh, we don't want to accidentally capture your image without your consent. Um, you may also want to hold your questions until after the event so that they aren't recorded. All right, time for a little bit of a warm up before the lecture starts. Let's see who we've got here. Hands up if you're comfortable sharing this information. Um, but don't worry, you are not consenting to me coming down awkwardly with the microphone and asking you more questions. That's not going to happen. Uh, but who here is part of our alumni community as a University of Salford graduate? Oh, welcome. Yeah, fair few of you, I'd say the majority. Um, so out of this group, who graduated within the last 10 years? Oh, got a couple of people. Yeah. Um, 11 to 20 years ago. So we're looking at like 2004 to 2013. Yeah. 21 to 30 years ago, yeah, a few of you. Uh, 31 to 40 years ago, you, we've got a really good mix here. Anyone, anyone more than 40 years ago? Yeah, <laughs> nice, <laughs> welcome. Um, do we have any current students in the audience? Yeah, watch, just one, just Paul. <laughs> Well, I won't say the next bit uh, because I don't think that's going to help you out, Paul. Um, I was going to say, your job is to find and talk to our alumni after this lecture and get their tips, but I think you're going to be doing that anyway. All right. Who works in the field that we're talking about tonight? So working in robotics automation. Oh, yeah, a few people. Um, I would have hoped, Nikki, that you would put your hand up for that. <laughs> Uh, who's interested in the topic, maybe knows a little bit about it, or works in a sector adjacent to it. Yeah, there are a few of us. All right. Who's completely new to this field? So maybe you're here to catch up with other alumni. Yeah, just here for the vibes. Yeah, free food. <laughs> yeah, a few of us. All right, so um, those people find me afterwards and we can discuss how much our mind is blown by this topic. Um, but I will stop punishing you all now through forced interaction. 
it is my pleasure to introduce our wonderful new Vice-Chancellor to properly start our London um, Alumni Lecture for 2024. So please put your hands together to welcome Professor Nick Beach. Thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you all for being here, for connecting and staying connected to the university. It is really brilliant to, to be here with you. My name is Nick Beach and I do have the best job in the world because being the VC of Salford, I have to say, is just a wonderful, wonderful experience. Somebody was asking me when I just got arri arrived, say, are you all sorted and you know what you're doing? I said, no, of course not. I've just come from a series of things that just batter one into the other. But actually, do you know, every single one of them is energizing. And whichever meeting I'm going to, whichever group of staff and students that I'm meeting, I always come away with a real buzz. So I started last October. And I have to say, I was really excited to, to get the job, partly because to me, it actually felt like coming home. There was a group of people who were really trying to make a real difference in the world through what we do for education and skills, through the research that we do, and the way that that connects to the things that people experience in their lives on a daily basis. So we're really not a university that's very ivory tower and is very siloed in its ways of, of thinking. We are all about how can we enrich lives. That is at the center of what we do. And enriching lives sometimes means the individual. How do we help people move through their education into careers that will really be the best that they could possibly do and enable them to make a real contribution. Over 40% of our current undergraduates come from areas which actually have the highest level of deprivation, 40%, that's incredible. They go on to be hugely, hugely successful. 92, around 92% go straight into employment. That is very unusual in the sector. Around 75% go into high-skilled, high-skilled occupations very unusual in the sector. That is because they come with great drive, they come with passion, and they work with staff who really care about them. And that is, to me, just wonderful. And that's really what the university community is about. If you think about the research that we do, again, that is an area of focus for us, which is really fundamental to, to who we are. We're a, a Robbins era university, 1960s university. And those universities were set up with a passion for making a difference and one which combined research and educa education, not keeping these things separate, but making sure the way we generate new knowledge and generate the community of people who use and put that knowledge into practice is all part of one. They are not separate things. And so for us, that principle of education and knowledge being available to everybody who can benefit from it, the Robbins principle, and having a real drive to encourage those people to put it into practice and make a difference because of it, that is fundamentally who we are. How do we do that all across the whole range of subjects and different things that we can do? Well, the answer to that is that we have to have a focus. And we've actually got four themes that help us with that focus. They're not in a priority ordering, but the first one is around prosperity and equity. So we do a huge amount of work on productivity, which is the way that um, it's often seen in the UK. So we do lots of business advice, lots of robotics are used, of course, to massively improve productivity in all sorts of um, fields. But also, we're really concerned with prosperity. How much do people have the chance to be part of the economy? How far do they have the opportunities and the health to be really involved in productive lives? So we put those two things together. Sustainability and environment, the same thing. We, we have got some of world-leading technology in sustainability, particularly around house building and the sorts of things around, done around power and energy usage. But we also do fantastic research on the tents that are currently used by refugees around the world. We do that for no money, but the point about it is that is actually enabling some people literally to stay alive at the moment. So those things matter to us in all sorts of ways. Healthy living. Really crucial. We've got some of the, we've got great industrial investment in the cutting edge um, diagnostic suite that we've now got. We're building a clinic that is going to be open to the public, not just for theoretical use. And we, are, um, we have all the post diagnostic stuff that works really well. But crucially, if you look at a lot of what impacts health, 
it's actually social. So it's how people live their lives, it's whether they have exercise or not, it's whether or not they are connected or they feel lonely. So we connect health and social fundamentally in everything that we do. And lastly, creativity and innovation and the cutting edge practices there. So we share a building with the BBC, for example. We've got a, a campus in Media City that, in which all of this co-production work is done. But creativity isn't just in the creative industries. Actually, look across health, look across sustainability, look across any form of industry. Actually, creativity and the brilliant work of innovation that's really tough to do, that's actually where we make a difference in the world. So it's right across everything we do. Tonight, we're going to be looking at, I think, a beautiful example of that. Merrick is just outstanding. You're going to hear a lot about robotics and the fantastic work that goes on there. Everything from health interventions right through to logistics and packing and all, all sorts of things that we need in our everyday lives. But crucially for us, the question is, what difference does this really make in the society of which we are a part? I think you're going to have a brilliant time tonight. We'll have some time for questions and answers uh, after we've had the session. But now I'll introduce Nikki, who's going to give the first part of this talk. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm going to start my first part of this with a big confession. So I don't know what you're expecting, but I'm not an engineer. Don't tell anybody, because people don't seem to know. So, so what I'm going to talk to you about is how robots are working with industries and how we do that at Salford. And when we first did this, what I wanted to do was bring you to Nerik. I was like, oh my God, why are we doing this at Nerik where I can show off how fancy our fantastic building is? So you're going to have to bear with me while I give you a slight virtual tour. So we are a 70 million, robot, uh, 70 million pound robotic centre and we are the North of England Robotic Innovation Centre, which is really long, so I will be sticking to calling us Nerik for the remainder of my talk. Uh, we are part of the University of Salford and we work with a lot of in, uh, universities beyond that. And we have three different lab laboratories at the uni in Nerik building and I'll talk about those. But we also access all the other wonderful facilities that Nick touched upon at Salford to make the best things. So we work with the Mawson's Makerspace people. We work with the other facilities within our building because there's no point in us having, there's no point in us investing the, the, the precious money that we get in things that duplicate things we've already got. So this is lab one. And when I talk to people about robots, this is the type of robot they're thinking about in their heads, the sort of robot they've seen making cars. So lab one is an industrial automation space, and this is our machining cell. And a machining cell takes a large block of something, and it drills bits out of it until it makes something else. And it's what we call subtractive manufacturing. So it takes something, and it takes things away to make a product. OK, this is our delta. Um, and it's a really big delta. So I don't, don't like to talk about size, but it's quite impressive when you see it in real life. Um, what a delta does is it sorts things really rapidly. So if you can imagine that going along that conveyor belt is a whole load of biscuits, and it's taking the biscuits and it's putting them in the right packaging. So it's picking up all your custard creams, they're going in, your bourbons are going in, that's what's happening there. And then we have an intelligent mobility space. So these two aren't robots. They're cobots, and the difference between a robot and a cobot is a cobot is a collaborative robot, and they're not in cages, and they're not in cages because they know you're there, so they don't need to be in a cage because you can hand things to them and they can hand things back again, and you can work side by side. And for a lot of our companies, these are really good because they're smaller, they don't need drilling to the floor to take up cage space, you can move them around, you can use them for a lot of different things. And then, oh, star of the show, everyone loves Spot the Dog. So this is Spot the Dog. Uh, he's a Boston Dynamic robot, and he maps things, and he takes a lot of readings. And that kind of sounds like I'm being very flippant about him, but he could walk around this room, and he could be taking everybody's temperature in the room. He could be scanning the room and mapping it. He could be taking measurements about the oxygen or whatever, and that is what he's used for on a daily basis. He is an autonomous mobile robot. And the thing that's on the other side that doesn't look as special is also an autonomous mobile robot, and it is a palletizing solution. So this is where you get a robot that stacks boxes onto a pallet, and the palletizing robot moves them around, and then you don't have forklift trucks with your human beings. And forklift trucks come with an inherent danger because they're big and they're machinery and they don't have really good visibility. So actually, if you can replace some of your forklifts with a pallet, 
Now you're getting it. And then we have a growth space upstairs. So a big thing that people do is they take a building, a beautiful building, and they fill it to the rafters. And then in two years' time, you go into Nick and say, Nick, can I have some more money for a new building? Because I haven't got any space for any more robots. So we've got a growth space upstairs. And in this space, we've got the trolley that you can see, which um, is used for quality assurance of products. It takes things off a product line, scans it, makes sure it is what it says it is, and puts it back. And the blue one is called a scarra. And that, that moves things very quick, very light loads, very fast. I think assembly of a laptop, that's what that does. So I've given you a little bit of background about what we've got. And now I'm going to tell you about what we do. So we've got a really diverse team, which is a mixture of industrial people with industrial backgrounds. We've got amazing academics like Wei. Uh, like we've got a maths professor as well who does control systems. He's great. Um, we work on industrial projects with everything from manufacturing waste processing, fashion, textiles, pharmaceuticals. There's very little industries we haven't worked with yet, and we're always open to do that. Um, we have that full range of expertise, and we help companies de-risk what they're trying to do. So sometimes a company will come to us with a problem, and they're not sure if it can be solved. They come in and they're like, we don't know if a robot can do this. So we might try it with one of our robots and be like, hey, you know, yeah, it can, and maybe you should think about investing. Uh, to date, we've worked with 100 businesses across Greater Manchester and beyond, and we're now, we initially set out working with SMEs, um, and now we're working with much bigger companies as well. It's a really exciting time in our life, even though we're only one in a little bit. So what's the problem? So why are we doing all this? The UK does not feature in the top 15 countries of industrial robotic adoption. Okay. The, in 2022, Germany delivered 5% growth in robots, and we only did three. So not only were we behind, but we ain't being left further behind. And you're probably wondering why that's a problem. Because we don't produce as much per head as our counterparts do. And that's the big issue. So for every, so Germany and France are 13 to 14% more productive per head than the UK. And chronic underinvestment is part of the UK's problem. So people haven't invested in robotics. They haven't invested in other things that make us more productive. Robots and automation is not the only solution to this issue, but they haven't invested. And that is part of what we're trying to help companies with. So... Greater Manchester is actually only at 90% of the UK's productivity. So not only is the UK behind other European countries, Greater Manchester is further behind again. And that's true of a lot of North of England, to be honest. 1% um, of companies in Greater Manchester have full automation. 67% have got some, but 30% are just starting to explore that. And they don't necessarily know where to start with it. So... I'm going to talk to you about the five Ds now. And I do love a good, like, mnemic that you can be like, oh, yeah, this is going to work for me and I'm going to understand it. Okay. So the five D tasks we talk to businesses about replacing with robotics and automation are dull tasks. So the things that are really boring, the things that human beings don't want to do. Right. So we had a company and they had someone who sanded for eight hours and they made creative products, this company. That's what they did. So all the creative people didn't want to stand around for eight hours a day sanding things. And unsurprisingly, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be really shocked by this, the sanding at the end of the day is not as good as the sanding at the beginning of the day. So then there's a quality problem, because the next day they're having to go back over it before they can start doing all that painting and fabulous things that they do to it to make it really creative. People don't want to do those jobs. They also don't like doing the dirty jobs. So the jobs that um, have got a lot of dust, or there's a lot of muck, or you're going to you know, crawl in a duct and clean out a duct. I watched a robot the other day cleaning out metal ducts. It was just how long it went, and it jet sprayed them and sucked up the water as it went. And they were like, before that, somebody did that. And that's, I mean, unless you're John McLean at a Die Hard, it doesn't sound like you want to be crawling around in ducts, really. But at this point, I feel like you've listened to me talk for a little bit. So I'm going to introduce Adam, and he's going to give you a little talk about his company and what he did. So hopefully Adam is going to play. Uh, 
I'm Adam Bayliss, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Castro's Limited. I mean, it's my job to look after the factory and make sure it flows well and the products get to customers safely. Our company was founded in 2006 by my dad, we run now by me and my brother, and uh, we make and sell cast iron radiators and export them all over the world. So since we started making radiators, we've always used a wet spray process and it's very manual and very labour intensive. Uh, and particularly with the shape of our radiators, it's really difficult to get inside into the nooks and crannies. And having analysed our processes, we established a new idea that we wanted to start dipping to get a really good base coat prime on them. And due to a lot of research and development, we've managed to get that working really well. The feedback from our staff from working in the environment, though, was less positive. They found it unpleasant, it was quite a hot area to work, it could be quite smelly and solvent, and the work was kind of boring and repetitive. Um, especially for a highly qualified sprayer like we've got in our factory. Working in a dipping room is challenging because it uh, smells too much, uh, the thinners is too strong, the extractor are too loud and we have ovens everywhere and it's too hot for one person stays there eight hours for a day. Around the summer of 2022, Neric reached out to us to ask if they could help us with automation or robotics. It was good timing for us because we were just dealing with the problem of dipping and we hadn't really considered using automation before because we just didn't have the experience in-house. Working with Neric was really easy. To start off with, we had an initial phone call to understand what our need was and what our problem was. And then they quickly followed up with a visit to our factory. They spent some time speaking to us, speaking to our guys, measuring up the space and observing the equipment we had. And then they went away and looked at some options. We bounced some ideas back and forth and some of the options dropped out quite quickly but therefore we eventually settled on a final solution and then Neric helped us work with the supplier to get a detailed quote and design. For Castrads, the benefits of automation have been that we get to look after our staff better. They're our most precious resource. So I just wanted to let you have a little flavour of... Um, if I can get this to move on. Perfect. I just wanted to let you listen to Adam for a second because he is far more interested than I am but he gives you a good flavour of those dull and dangerous tasks that people don't want to do. Um, the other tasks that are different in the 5Ds are the dear tasks, the things that actually cost us a lot of money to do for a variety of reasons that, that it's, you know, it's lifting a significant amount of weight, it takes a lot of people to do, those kind of things. And then there's also the difficult tasks. So the things that your hands aren't necessarily made to get into that angle to do that thing, that a robot can do much more quickly and much more easily. And Wei is going to touch on some of these when he talks to you about healthcare, because some of these Ds transfer over that way as well. So the benefits of automation are manual and repetitive tasks, the things people don't want to do. It can give you a competitive advantage, and it can give you a competitive advantage, like Nick said, increasing your productivity and improving your prosperity of your staff. The jobs that you have are higher quality, and you're paying people more money to do them because the robots are taking the things people don't want to do. Um, it's helped to bring things to market faster. So we do a lot of work of what's called rapid prototyping. So we actually had somebody turn up to the building and they'd had a part that, had, that had, was no longer functioning and they kind of wanted to develop it into a new part and they turned up with their old part and some lollipop sticks and a bit of cardboard sellotape to it. And we scanned it and we made a CAD model out of it, which a CAD model um, for people we don't do this every day, which I don't, a computer-aided plan, basically. And then we print it out in 3D, and they took it back to see if it worked. Does that fit the space they want to do? Now, old school ways of that is that they'd be there chiseling it out of metal or wood and trying to make it work. It's so much faster, and it gets them there faster. And you're reduced, if you're spending less time, then it's automatically more productive, and it's, it's going to be quicker to market. Um, it can help with safety and risk mitigation, which people don't always get. You know, some of these jobs where you're breathing in a lot of fibres aren't healthy for humans. So people think of robots as being dangerous, but actually they can save you from the danger. So Spot the Dog is in a lot of power stations, roaming around, taking measurements where it's not really safe for humans to be. It can help with labour shortages, cost control, quality control, all of those things. But the three E's are efficacy. Can a robot do it under the right conditions in a lab? Okay. Efficiency, can it do it quickly and economically? And effectiveness, can it then do that in the real world? Now, if you can hit all three, you're probably in a space where robotics can really help you take it forward. 
if you're not in that space, and it sometimes does happen, we find robots can't do it cheaper. They can't do it more effectively than a human because the technology's not there yet. And that's where my wonderful academic colleagues come in. They come in to push that innovation to see what's next, what can we do next, how can we make that happen. So this is the slide that people don't like. It's robots, it's all about people. Um, because I get asked a lot, robots are going to take our jobs and those kind of statements. They're, no, they're not here to take your job, they're here to get rid of the things people don't want to do. The jobs that companies struggle to recruit to. The ones that are really hard, tackling those five Ds. Um, and it's for the things that people are best for. And people are always really surprised when I say robots really struggle to mimic what you have on the ends of your wrists. You know, you can pick something up and know if it's hot or cold, and you can know if it's hard or soft, and you can pick a soft fruit off the plant. Those are the tasks that it's taken a long time to teach robots how to do. But it also means that the creative things that humans do, we are freed up to do them and to be better at that. Um, and the last point um, I would say, before I touch on these lovely people in this slide, is we talk to companies a lot about buying a robot versus being sold it. And I always think about the first time you buy a car or if you've never bought a laptop before or a smartphone and you go in and they're asking you all these questions and they might as well be talking a foreign language at you because you're a little bit out your depth and you're like, I don't know if I need RAM. I don't know how much RAM I need. I don't, do I need air conditioning? But those kind of things are really intimidating. We want companies to feel empowered to buy a robot and not be sold it by a company. And sometimes they're sold it for the right reasons. The company think that they're giving them, they're saying this and the company gives them that, but that's not really what they want. And sometimes they really don't know what they want if someone sells it. So um, we had a company who came in, they'd spent 70,000 pounds on a piece of kit. They were frustrated, they couldn't make it do what they wanted. And they were more frustrated when our team told them it can't do what you want because it doesn't meet your needs, it doesn't meet your brief. So we're really about empowering a lot of businesses to do that. And before I introduce my colleague, Wei, this is the team at Nerik, in Nerik. And so when I say it is all about people, it's I'm not in the photo because I was, <laughs> I was in a meeting. Story of my life. Um, <laughs> but this is the team at Nerik who help companies and they really get out there and talk to business and try and find out what their needs are and how we can help them. Um, so at that point, I'm going to hand over to Wei, who's on the front row and will be on the stage in a minute. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, uh, good evening, and uh, Professor Nee Peach. Uh, so, uh, oh, it should be my slide. Yeah, um, my name is Wei Ya, I'm Professor in Robotics, associated with NARIC, and I'm from the School of Science, Engineering, and Environment at the University of Salford. So my research focuses on developing cutting uh, cutting edge uh, uh, technologies for healthcare. And uh, I'm also an innovator that bridging academia, industry, and healthcare providers to bring innovative medical, uh, robo uh, medical robotic device into the clinical practice. Uh, so uh, today, uh, I'm, going, I'm not going to talk about something horrible. I think uh, it's, it's wonderful today for me to have a talk in this building because I'm, go I'm going to talk about something for uh, robotics for surgery. So um, today um, I'm, I'm, going to, to, I'm going to talk how innovation can shape the future of healthcare. Uh, so first of all I would like to sim uh, synthesize that innovation is not only uh, critical for, the, uh, for our, our country's economic growth, but also it's play a pivotal role uh, in, some, in addressing some critical social issues, such as uh, the, the challenges our, our, our NHS faced. Uh, so in the next uh, uh, 20 minutes, uh, I'm, I'm going to ex explore uh, some um, some medical uh, robotics on how it addresses the NHS uh, challenges from workforce shortages, from uh, a long waiting, uh, long patient waiting times, uh, and also a need for uh, integrating uh, care solutions. Uh, 
so uh, I'm also going to uh, talk about so, uh, and explore some real examples from my research and uh, exciting uh, future trends that could um, transform healthcare uh, delivery and also make it uh, re really different to patients. So, um, so let's talk, talk about uh, NHS challenges. Because uh, Britain's a pro of uh, NHS, but we all know that there are some problems we need to fix. Uh, for example, I, I list some um, challenges, uh, but of course we know we have a lot of uh, challenges, but uh, these three are, I think, are emerging. Uh, the first one actually is a dilemma because uh, the first one is increasing demand from NHS. It's, it's from um, the, the increasing uh, aging population. It's from the request for more advanced medical devices and medical technologies. Uh, and, uh, and also from the expectation for a high quality of um, service, uh, NHS service. So, um, but, but however, although the, the budget of NHS also increased and, uh, and uh, uh, achieved to 119 billion do, uh, pounds recently, but it still not be able to meet the requirements or meet the increasing demands. So the second challenge is uh, the work, workforce shortages and the long waiting times, which is get, getting worse after the pandemics. We have, we achieved to 7 million um, patients in the waiting list uh, uh, after pandemics and some, some British with heart attacks have to wait in 90 minutes for ambulance. So that's a seriously challenge. And, um, and the third one, we concern also the, the access to care and the health care inequalities. Um, it, it, the the, the health care inequalities could, from um, the, the geographic location, uh, it could from um, social economic status and also like uh, cultural um, uh, barriers. So I'm going to talk later how we use robotics to 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 co um, cope with these challenges. So uh, so today I'm going to focus on how robotics address NHS challenges. I I'm going to divide it in. Uh, the, 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 it's into two levels. The first level is how to use robotics to improve in patient outcomes. So I will focus on, uh, on the robo ro robotics, how robotics uh, bring a, a more accurate uh, um, outcomes and uh, faster recovery and rehabilitation. And it's, it's, there is a clear trend here, which is surgery is moving towards greater minimally invasive techniques. So this is the first uh, trend. The second level, I'm going to talk how robotics addressing a broader issues uh, across uh, the healthcare uh, delivery, uh, and uh, including enhancing if, if, uh, efficiency and in, uh, enabling uh, personal um, personalized care and the most important integrating health and the social care. And here there are second very more, uh, important and clear trend which is uh, NHS is towards delivering most of their health care out of hospitals <coughs> and closer to home. So over the last 15 years I follow in these principles and, uh, and these trends uh, for my research on medical robotics. So, uh, l let me start to introduce some um, commercial surgical robotic systems because I presume have you, any of you have ever seen any surgical robot or surgical robotic system? Only two. But you must have been saying this, saying this because when you enter this building, 
towards the register office, you pass the the robotic <laughs> the robotic system called Da Vinci system. So like uh, the one on my right hand, uh, right hand. So there is a uh, two typical robotic system for surgery. The one is the um, Mako system uh, from Stryker, sp uh, especially designed for orthopedic surgery, which bring, which using uh, medical GPS technology. So provide the digital planning and the guidance for the surgery. So the other one is famous, the Da Vinci system uh, you, you, you have seen in this building. Uh, which is actually a teleoperated platform uh, and uh, uh, aimed at augmenting uh, the dexterity, the precision, uh, and the robotic control. So both of the system are actually served as an augmented tool rather than uh, surgeons worry about replacing them. So that is current uh, uh, lab, uh, the robotic system for surgery. So you, you must ask question, why you use ro robotics for surgery? How important it is? So let's take a look at the evolution of surgery. Um, if we re reflect to the earliest uh, surgical theater, it's more like a, a butcher's chamber. It's full of blood and guts. Uh, and surgery was, was typically invasive. Uh, however, over time in the early 20th century, the advancement of the minimally invasive technologies such as keyhole surgery, like laparoscopic, endoscopic, painhole surgery, like cardiac catheterization, they have dramatically uh, transformed uh, transform the landscape. So the trend is, trend is clear for surgery. The surgery towards um, greater minimally invasive, minimally invasive techniques. So let's look ahead. So uh, the future even pro promise even small, smaller invasive and potentially lead to non-invasive surgery or scalar surgery. For example, nodes, nodes is a surgical technology that um, to do these operations through the natural orifice. Or uh, we call it uh, a, a surgical technology, it's a single port laparoscopic surgery, which is uh, through the uh, belly button. Belly button is a natural uh, scar, so we call it uh, scalar surgery. So, in this trajectory here, the robotic assistance is indispensable because the surgeon can't reach that surgical field and even they can't watch it. So uh, the, the, the surgeons will, all, will feel limitation on their dexterity of their hands, particularly in some um, in some. Uh, Conf, conf, confident or, or intricate areas um, and very difficult to, to get to reach. So uh, this is why the robotic system is, is essential for, for the, the surgery in the future. So let's look at the, the, some examples from my research and uh, uh, as an initial case study. So um, I'm going to talk about a, a how we design and develop a, uh, an a intelligent, intelligent drill system for orthopedic surgery. So um, orthopedic, orthopedic surgery like um, uh, knee or hip replacement, that is uh, ranked as uh, one of the most uh, common um, procedures in the uh, waiting patient waiting list. Uh, and the, the, the orthopedic surger, surgery, the traditional orthopedic surgery is using the hand rasping technology, um, which uh, um, we believe that uh, 
more, more experienced uh, surgeon, the, the surgeon, and the better the outcome. So, um, a, a, the surgeons like a carpenters, and uh, they just use their feeling to do the surgical procedure, so it's not very accurate. So, the things has been changed by introduce this robotic system. If you remember, I introduced the MAKO system from, from Stryker. Because uh, the, the, uh, the, this system has three, three components. One is they use a, um, the, the, the industry type robotic arm. Uh, that although it's the passive, because the surgeons still control the, the robot, but they provide haptic, haptic feedback. Uh, and the second component is this, uh, you can see like, uh, uh, the, the, the stereo camera which provides the tracking, so provides the real-time position and orientation for the, all the objects uh, related to the surgical field. And the third one is that uh, it is a, we call it medical GPS digital platform uh, that uh, surgeons can, can watch the 3D model from, fr fr from the patient's uh, anatomy and uh, de design the trajectory they want uh, uh, relies on these uh, uh, personal, personalized data uh, and also they can get feedback during their surgery. So you can imagine that uh, uh, if you use this robotic system, the, the procedure will be very accurate. However, there are some problems for this system. First of all, it's very expensive. It's over one million pounds for one unit. And the same way as the Da Vinci system here, it's over one million pounds per unit. So it's not affordable for hospitals. And also it's um, quite large and bulky and not be uh, easy to be settled, uh, settled in, in the um, surgical theatre. And also the function is not such smart and the function is limited. So based on this, uh, so my, my research, research team has already um, such, uh, designed and developed a, a system to try to advance this technology. So the first step, we designed a finger-type finger uh, steerable and flexible drill to replace this huge industrial robotic, robotic arm. And secondly, we designed our new tracking sensor, which is more portable, flexible, and uh, more accurate. So, and also, we developed our uh, new medical, uh, medical GPS system. So GPS is like your, your card, you can plan and uh, the, you, you, the, the satellites t uh, tell you where your location in the digital map. So um, we um, have uh, integrated the, the, sensing, the sensing data embedded in this steerable drill, integrated with the tra traditional tracking uh, information and uh, uh, reflected it to this digital map and uh, allow us to perform some complex uh, operations even inside the, the bone uh, where the current robot, even the current robotic system can't reach. So that is our uh, advance. So I would like to show you a uh, video to show, uh, to, to show how this device is working. So you can see the digital, the digital map, the digital platform. You can see the real-time uh, instrument and the planned um, 3D model. Oh, that's me. Can you show you go outside and go in?
is for hip replacements. So, so how this robotic system um, can bring the, the real benefits and address the, 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 the uh, healthcare uh, challenges. The first, as the first level, uh, this, this new system to, to bring uh, in a new functions that uh, even, for example, current uh, medical robotics even not be able to do, to do the, um, uh, they, they can do, to prepare the, the car, but they can't prepare the, uh, the, the, the female. So, but our system uh, can even mill a perfect the 3D shape inside the bone, so perfectly fit the, the shape of the implants. And also the traditional uh, drill, uh, even robotic drills, they are rigid, so they need a larger incision, but use the flexible drill, we can make a, a very small, uh, a greater minimally invasive uh, operation. It is the first level. At the second level, so how we can improve healthcare delivery. So as, as I said, the trend, the second trend is NHS towards delivering more healthcare outside of hospitals. So use the, the, the digital GPS, medical GPS system, which means it can provide a standard and a consistency guidance, which provides a very accurate uh, um, outcome. So that means even junior doctors, guided by this digital system, they can perform even the same level outcome compared to their senior peers. So that means even you didn't increase the number of surgeons, but you increases the, the number of a qualified surgeon. So the second one is that, that you can say we can pack our new system, you can pack all the components into one suitcase. That means the, sur the surgeons can carry out this, uh, uh, their own surgical robot and uh, move to uh, um, travel to local community or local clinics and to do this operation, this vastly um, reduce uh, or, or, or improve the, the healthcare inequalities. So, so this is also my dream, is that uh, bring the surgical robotic system from hospital to day surgery and the local clinics. So um, the second start, um, the, the, the case is also uh, we, we try, we're trying to, to demonstrate is how we design a, a variable soft robotic glove uh, for stroke rehabilitation uh, at home. So there are some challenges as well for, for, for stroke rehabilitation. We know that around the, the world there are 15 million uh, um, patients suffer the stroke every year. So, um, but the problem is more patients um, need this rehabilitation uh, treatment, of course, maybe because the, the increased aging population, but the, 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 the rehabilitation is very intensive and it needs one-to-one -one sections. So that means it's quite limited the number of uh, rehabilitation specialists. So that's the, the first challenge. The second one is uh, if patients can use a device, the robotic device at home, it could um, maximize the exposure and the exercise um, compliance, so leading to a great potential. So these are our aims that to, to bring robotic device into home for stroke rehabilitation. Um, but the current design, current device is uh, too large, too bulky, uh, too expensive, and not uh, uh, use-friendly to, to use at home. Uh, 
So this is why we're trying to design a new device that is smaller, light, that be able to, and use friendly, that be able to use at home. And we inspi inspired this design from nature. You can say the octopus can wrap objects, objects and manipulate it. So we get, idea, we, we get the idea from the nature that we uh, designed a double layer uh, robotic glove and we embed suction cups into the inner layer. So when you uh, apply suction force, it, it will suck and grasp on the, uh, the, on the, on the um, patient's hand. And the suction cups act as uh, anchors. So guide the cable. The cables uh, are driven by electromotor uh, um, screwed on the on the arm, uh, on the um, port on the arm, uh, and uh, the the patient's hand performs as a frame. So avoiding use some um, heavy mechanical structure. So uh, we made a, a prototype. We test it. So we 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 consult uh, with um, the the healthcare specialist, uh, and we have a a more significant uh, leap forward through collaborating with um, neuroscientists in the National, Health, uh, Nas National Institu Institute of Rehabilitation in Mexico. We link our robotic hand, robotic glove, to their human brain interface uh, provide the e uh, EEG feedback. So in this case, we create a new platform that potentially we use the patient's own mind or intentions to control this robotic glove. So this will provide a more uh, person personalized, uh, uh, more intuitive and engaging rehabilitation. And in the future, potentially also uh, used as an uh, assistive device for, uh, to, to help the, the patient's daily life. So, uh, in this point, I will emphasize that how the importance for the collaborating between uh, academia, industry and healthcare, healthcare uh, providers. Without this collaboration, we can't um, uh, move forward. So, future trends and development uh, so what is uh, the next step? So uh, the first of all, I think uh, many of you have started by, by the recent development uh, uh, of AI like chat, GTP, even some, some new tools they launched uh, a few days ago, it's called uh, Sora. Um, so that, that advanced advancement just recently, recent year, a couple of years, have really bring a new possibility, a new shift in medical robotics from enhancing to replace some human involvement. So as a big advance. Uh, so that, that is uh, that new technology can bring to the medical robotics in the future. Uh, the second one is uh, um, what, what was the prediction for the growth and adoption of healthcare robotics. So if you compare the old PC with your smartphone and how this um, the big device develop uh, involved into this smartphone, the, the surgical robotics will be looks like this. So from the huge one you saw in, in, in the building will we'll develop into a small robot and can packed into a suitcase carried by each surgeon and do these operations in, in local. Uh, and also potential impact on patient care, as I said, the 
the, the most important is make the uh, improve the surgical outcomes, uh, and also that can uh, cope with the challenge from uh, NHS, and also. I would like to emphasize the, the collaboration between uh, academia, industry, and healthcare providers, uh, how important it is for us. So, conclusion uh, robotics offers multi phased solutions to address NHS uh, challenges, improved patient outcomes, and in enhancing efficiency and uh, enabling uh, personalized care. Uh, and the most important to move or uh, most of the surgery from hospitals to uh, local clinics. That's my dream. Thank you very much. Oh, you've escaped. Could you come back? <laughs> So thank you, thank you for that uh, wonderful well, two, uh, talk in two parts. Uh, Wei and, and Nikki, thank you so much. We have a little bit of time uh, for, for questions. Um, and so let me throw it open to the, to the floor. Yes. Can I ask Professor Wei about GPS? Can I ask Professor Wei about GPS? Uh, satellites in the sky. Does that give the accuracy in the operating theatre? Yes, in operating theatre, the GPS, uh, the satellite becomes the, the optical, the camera. So it provides sub-millimeter accuracy. No, you don't use the satellites okay. for surgery. It's a local GPS. Yeah, local GPS. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, I should have said, we'll bring round a, a microphone because of the recording so that it can be heard uh, afterwards. Thank you. Hi, um, are all NHS trusts currently using this technology? And if not, when do you think they will be? Uh, sorry, can you, can you... Are all NHS trusts currently using this technology at the moment? You, you may use my technology or... Yeah, the, the uh, machines that we see downstairs. Downstairs, uh, y yes, um, yes, but uh, it's only used uh, in some very big hospitals. Yeah, because as I said, it's too expensive. Hospitals can't, NHS can't afford it. Uh, just going back to your point about um, the not being able to afford it, um, is this affordable? Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, so um, you mentioned about affordability of the solution downstairs. So your, the solution you've presented this evening, is that affordable? Well, as I said, uh, only a very big uh, hospital can afford it, uh, but because its price uh, it can't afford by most of the hospitals, so it can't spread to uh, the, the most uh, hospitals. But that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before with the things that are dear. Cutting edge is always really expensive, and the more that you do it and you refine it and you make it better, the cheaper it'll get, the more places can access it, um, you know, and that's, that's the goal, isn't it? If, if we don't do it because it's expensive, then, then we, we can't afford to do it any other way. So it, you know, it's back to that productivity point, isn't it? And the prosperity of the country, I think. This is the importance of innovation. We have to provide uh, the, the uh, new devices that can, can be used uh, broadly. But to be fair, I mean, the question's a really important one because it needs to get to the point of affordability and that's part of the innovation phase as well as the initial development. But you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I think spot the dog is Austin Dynamics. Yeah. How close are we to doing that here? We wouldn't do that here because that's the point of innovation. You don't do the thing that's done, you do the next thing. Oh, the next stage. Well, so Boston Dynamic are already on with the biped. I don't know if you've seen the video. So they've got a biped robot that kind of runs around, and it's quite it's quite amazing to like to watch. Like you can get you can get lost on YouTube watching videos and things. So I don't think they're that far away from that. It's not something we're doing at Nerick. It's not where our expertise lies. Um, obviously, we've got Way and, and all the wonderful things he's doing. We've got some other expertise across the department. But I think it is moving at, at a rapid pace. 
you know, I mean, when I bought a robot Hoover two years ago, everyone thought I was crazy, and now half my friends have them. So if, if it's moving that fast in domestic spheres, you've got to think about how fast it's moving in, in innovation, in space, in all the other areas. And, and that's why it's really important that Way and I do work with other institutions and we link up with other universities to, to make sure we're tapping into the expertise that's out there. So uh, you mentioned you know, the uh, robot arm, which did the subtractive um, building. Do you also at all use 3D printers for like, additive? And how common would you say, kind of when you work with industry, additive versus subtractive? Ooh, that's, that's two questions. I'll go on to the first one because it's easier. Um, so, yeah, so subtractive manufacturing is where you take a block and you remove it, a bit like a sculptor would remove stone from a thing. And additive is 3D printing where it builds up from nothing into a shape. Um, I think it's becoming much more commonplace. Um, it certainly is in GM because obviously we've got um, the Mawson's Makerspace and we've got 3D printers at work at Nerik that we use. Um, we also work with... Um, Manchester who have Print City which is a 3D print facility there so there's a lot of opportunities that even if you don't have a 3D printer you can use them but you know going back to that innovation five years ago 3D printers were outside the scope of having them in your home and I know people who have them at home now so I think that as technologies move forward back to the gentleman on the left point it's going to get cheaper and therefore you're going to see more of them and then the technology really starts to shoot up that scale of development. So yeah, I think they're getting to be a lot more commonplace. I guess I've got two, two questions, or lots of questions, but what the one I was asked was, um, what are you doing with drones, and how do they fit into this debate? And also, where do you stand with ethics? Boston done it's got different things on top of the hooks, uh, which aren't necessarily as ethical, they might be in the same drones. Yeah, um, so at Nerik we don't, do anything with drones and the reason is is that we don't have a drone safe space um, the ceiling of our building is open so you can see all the lighting and the gubbins and the problem with that is you can crash a drone into those things and it's not safe so it's not something we do there in C they have drone expertise and they are pushing it forward and they're looking at what they're doing there I won't pretend that I'm an expert in what they're doing because I would be lying quite considerably but I understand the 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 thing about drones and about spot the dog, I'm assuming you're referring to weaponization, which is a problem. Boston Dynamic themselves as a company are very anti-weaponization of this thing, but they also acknowledge that it is being used by the military to move supplies between troops in the field. So when we looked at spot the dog, because he's got four legs, he can run on uneven surfaces. Um, and so he can go over hummocks and uneven grounds and he doesn't need to know what's there to go there. Um, personally, it's not something I think we should go down, but I understand there are going to be countries out there that might. So it's not something we as an institution really get into that kind of aggressive weaponization of robots, um, but we are aware that it happens, sadly. It's a shame because Spot's adorable. Yeah. Uh, there seems to be quite a lot of interesting innovation that's going on. To what extent is that paid in at all? And to what extent have we taken our patents for the university? Sorry, what extent is that? Paintable. Oh, I'm going to leave that one to you. Patents. Patents, yeah. Uh, it, I mean, paintings is some. Patenting something is really crucial for innovation because it protects our IP. Uh, so when we, when we set up a research project or innovation project, we will bear in mind how we protect those IP and if we have something patentable, we will connect with uh, the office in, the, in our universities to, 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 to file these patents. Yeah, hello. Um, I mean, a fascinating evening and, and, um, and, and really the tip of the iceberg on the issue, I think. Um, my, my question is about students and student numbers and student interest and expression in this area. So you, you are a year and a half in the making. Um, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts about projections on student numbers. So what do you have now associated with the programmes? And what, say, in three to five years could you imagine you? 
So this is an awkward one, actually, um, because NERIC is, is designed to do innovation and work with industry. We don't have any students within the building. What we look to is that um, the brilliant academics like Wei and our colleagues are supporting the teaching programmes that already exist. So beyond that, I can't talk to student numbers because I don't have anything to do with them other than PhDs, which we obviously have in the building because that is, that's the difference between taught and research and it's a, it's a very fine line. Um, beyond that, we are looking to put in place some CPD programmes that NERIC will be able to offer to business to upskill the existing workforce, so I can say that. I think that's fair. Nicky, we met just before actually, and you mentioned about um, people having quite an emotional response to robots and incorporating them into their work and all that kind of stuff. Um, could you expand on that a little bit more? There's obviously the cost implications of investing. Um, is there a, what's the human element and how's that changing? Oh, how is it changing? Um, so I think what is really reassuring is that a lot of business owners are really trying to work through a change management piece with their team. They really value their employees and they really know how good they are. And they want to bring in robots to support them, but they don't want to do it at the expense of, you know, everybody leaves. They're not looking to get rid of jobs. So, you know, I get that question a lot of, you know, is a robot going to take my job? It's about getting rid of those tasks that they can't recruit to anyway and keeping the people for the for the productive, creative jobs. But also, you know, that's why we're gonna offer that CPD offer because they wanna upskill their staff, they wanna upskill and be more pros prosperous. How do we support them to do that? So quite a lot, we find ourselves in a, in a, working with our business school colleagues about change management, supply change management, what does it look like for your employees? How's that gonna work? And we have had some companies that work with us who go, we want to do this, we're just not quite there as a company yet. And I think that's okay to say. I think it's, it's fine to say, I don't, you know, we want to do this and we see it coming. We're not there. You know, we're not ready. We don't have the space. We don't have the investment. We, we, you know, one company out and out came back and said, we love it. We just need to do more work with our staff before we invest in it. Um, and I get that anxiety. You know, people have seen this before in manufacturing. But a lot of the time, what's actually happening is they're using the robots to be more productive. They end up taking on people, more people, because they're producing more and they can meet a demand that's out there. You know, um, it, it's really exciting. Castrads were looking, the, the company that spoke on the video, are looking to expand because the demand is there. They make these beautiful radiators. Why wouldn't you, you know, if, if that's the sort of, house you have why wouldn't you want one that fitted your house that's brand new that's and they can't meet the demand fast enough and that's the biggest thing we hear is i'm not looking to get rid of staff i just can't meet the demand fast enough okay we're pretty much out of time but if there's one last question we can take it thank you it's not exactly a question it's more a comment uh, just looking at what you said about Manchester being 90% of the UK average for investment and development, and as you already said, that the UK is pretty poor at that. And a side comment to our friend at the other end about the NHS. No, not all the NHS trusts will have things like that because the NHS is actually pretty awful at investing in, in equipment. If you look at any type of high-end equipment in the UK, compare it with Germany or some of the other European countries, you, you certainly have a much lower take-up of that equipment than you do in, in Europe. Um, so when I look at the numbers and hear those numbers, uh, Manchester's 90% of the UK average, which is a poor average. Um, what actions and what areas are you going to work on to try and make sure that um, Manchester's like 100 40% of the UK average within about five years. Because uh, I saw some really interesting numbers recently about uh, the number of patents uh, per head of population in various cities. And well, most people in, in the room might well guess that Cambridge has got the highest number. And it's not highest by a bit, it's the highest by a huge amount, like about 
uh, four or five hundred percent more than in Europe's. Anyone like to guess where the second one is? <laughs> okay, it's Coventry, which people wouldn't necessarily guess, Coventry because of Rolls Royce. So, what's, what's Salford going to do to help uh, Salford and the Greater Manchester area uh, overtake Coventry and close in on Cambridge? So, I don't just think it's down to Rolls Royce and Coventry actually. So. University of Birmingham and a number of other universities have something very similar to NERIC that's been established for 10 to 15 years called the uh, Manufacturing Technology Centre. They're part of that. They're based on the site, Rolls Royce is next door and a large robot manufacturer is the other side. So part of their patents is coming out of their work and they talk about the bit in the middle. So the bit between industry and academia, they say that a lot of products just go there to die and that's what they're trying to fill the gap. That's what we're trying to fill the gap with. Uh, we're just, you know, a little bit, we're just a little bit behind. <laughs> but we're getting there. And actually 90% isn't bad for Greater Manchester because it's an average. So there will be ones that are a lot, a lot, lot lower. You know, every place is facing its challenges of being more productive. Um, and I think there's so much opportunity to do it. And one of the things that we at NERIC pride ourselves in is when you've done working with us, we're trying to pass you on to another agency, whether that's funding, whether that's to help you unlock the next level of innovation by help working with us to put a bid in for funding, whether that is colleagues like where you were pushing the science and the innovation right to the edge. You know, we're trying to pass those people on to the people who can help them make their next step. You know, um, there's a company that worked with us and we helped them with something really, really small. We helped them talk about automation really early doors and we did it for free. They're now working with our biology colleagues and they're spending quite a considerable amount of money because we've helped them unlock a technology that I can't talk about <laughs> because it's going to be a new product for them and it's going to revolutionise how they're doing what they're doing. And then we help them make that product as a 3D model. So sometimes it's about how do you get all the pieces, all the cogs to fit together in the right order. And I think that's what's really great about Salford. So take your point about Cambridge, but I'm still not sure I'll pack up and go. <laughs> I, think, I think Salford's right there on the edge of innovation. Yeah, I wasn't trying to criticise Salford. So. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, I actually have worked outside of the UK for 20 odd years and I've been back in the UK for a couple. And so I'm here for the first time tonight just to see what's going on with the old alumni. But also, um, partly because I've seen over the last two or three years you know, the really good things that sort has been doing. So, um, you know, the uh, Manchester was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. So I think you've got the right people in the right place and the right sort of a setting to do it. I'm just wondering what programmes you've got available to you and whether you're going to get support from someone like Andy Burnham, you know, to get those sorts of things done. Um, I mean, I have family living up in the Manchester area, so I know quite a lot of what's going on up there. So it's, it, it's, it, it's good to hear, but it'd be really nice to hear the, the story of how are you going to make the transformational change. I suspect that is a topic for another session, but, but you're quite right. And there is a spirit to the place that has been there in history and is still there now. And I think there is a real will to work actually with the political environment and with the business environment and with the technological and academic environment. I think actually Manchester and Greater Manchester and Salford is a special bit of it, actually has a real will to do that. The other thing I would say is if you look at a lot of areas of the UK economy, depends on which area, but quite often over 90% of it, of the business economy, is made up of very small companies, not, not even medium size. So part of what is happening here, I think, is also a methodology being devised that can apply in all sorts of other settings, but with the very small organisations that often don't have the resource or the wherewithal to do that sort of thinking and that sort of investment. So. I think that kind of collaboration is, is a lovely example of the way we can go. More money is always welcome, of course, to enable it. So I'll, um, I'll pass on your good wishes to Andy. <laughs> right.
Before we say thank you to Nikki and Wei for that really wonderful session, I will just let you know there are uh, some more drinks and canapes available tonight. They're being served by human beings, but next year. <laughs> but before we go to that, could we please say thank you so much to Nikki and Wei? Fantastic session. Well done.